right. Welcome, everyone. It's Chris Petri. Thanks so much for coming by. We're going to have a great time, a fun time. We're going to create swatches. We're going to create small swatches, large swatches. You're going to practice your painting skills. Even if you're an old pro, it doesn't hurt to practice up on your painting skills, I should say. And we're going to do it all here in the next hour or so. Grab your brushes, your paints, your paper, and let's go. Let's get started. And remember, we're going to use... Uh, you have to go back into your uh, art supplies, you know, and we need small and large brushes because we're going to paint small swatches as well as some really large ones. So we're going to use our uh, smaller size brushes and our large size brushes. And also, too, we're going to use our regular smaller Minke palette as well as our Anderson palette here. So we're going to use our large palette when we start creating our larger swatches. So... Have fun with this, enjoy, and we'll get started. And uh, let's keep going. Let's get through this whole video, having a great time practicing. We're gonna be mixing colors, doing graded washes, understanding warm and cool color mixes. So it's all about techniques and methods in watercolor that are gonna get your paintings to the next level. Okay, so let's start. All right, everyone, we're gonna get started here. We're gonna do some really important and key uh, fundamental practicing exercises doing uh, swatches. So we have our palette all ready to go. Sometimes I'll just add a little bit of um, spritzer water to my palette just to get those paints a little bit more moist. Um, and uh, that's pretty much all set and ready to go. Um, I usually use either uh, the collapsible water containers by Holbein and um, or I use my canteen um, container for my water and I keep it to my right side over here on my table, my uh, art table here. I've got a um, piece of, um, uh, it's called masonite. It's like a one, one eighth inch. I have to maybe get a small bit of it here. Let's see, I got this. So if you can imagine, this would be looking at the underside in reverse of my table. So I have this piece of, um, this is like, uh, th this is used for like, uh, to put underneath carpets so the carpets don't slide. You can get this in any like uh, big box store that sells carpets and pillows and bedding and, you know, kind of places like that. It comes in rolls and I, I always have a couple rolls on hand because I use this a lot. So this is uh, on the other, uh, it's on the underside with double stick tape. So there's, you can buy double stick tape really at any online or in any you know location worth like big box stores um hardware stores things like that then underneath this this is actually the bottom the very very bottom of my board that i'm working on then next is a masonite board which is one a thick and i had the uh people at the big box store home depot i had them cut me a piece a couple different sizes so i took one sheet one large sheet of uh, four foot by eight foot one eighth inch masonite board. And then I had, I asked them to measure specific size pieces. And then they cut that board, that large sheet uh, into smaller pieces, like two foot by three foot, you know, one foot by two foot, 18 by 24, the different sizes that I might need. So that's that eighth inch hard masonite board. It's almost like, almost like a uh, plywood, but really, really thin, only an eighth inch thick. And then I have on, top of that I have double stick tape foam board so I have that really thin foam board like this and then I put this on my table and I put it on a little bit of a pitch so that it's angled downwards towards me this way a little bit only a little bit a two by four actually I use a two by four to prop up this end of my my board up here so I have a two by four like this across my table underneath my board and of course this is the foam I use on top and then I tape my paper onto that like you see here I have my and I put a small piece of construction paper underneath here so it looks better on camera. But if I'm not making videos, then I'm just using this foam board and I just tape my paper right on that and paint. So that's what how I have my board set up here on my table and I'm standing at a, a custom built table I made. It looks more like a shop table you would see in a basement or uh, like a shop table you might see in a, um, a carpenter's shop or something like that on uh, this old house or you know something like that like a like a bench I made a heavy-duty bench and uh, so that's all I have for my board here that I work on it's nice and sturdy that's what I work on actually and again it's on a slight angle going this way 
And um, I have some paper here. I think this is um, Arches rough paper. And uh, for just practicing, it's a scrap paper. So there's a painting on the other side that didn't come out too good. So then I just flipped the paper over and now I have a good working sheet to do some practice on. Um, the next thing I'm doing here is I'm thinking sometimes I like to be more accurate. So I'll use maybe some stencils occasionally. So these you can get online, of course. These are made by Fiskars. And um, Statler is another brand. Statler and Fiskars make great stencils. So these are the square uh, stencils. And you can do fun stuff like draw floor plans for houses. Maybe if you're going to rearrange your furniture, you might use these as like, you know, things to draw out your furniture with. They have all different kinds of... Um, uh, stencils too, like the shapes of couches or beds or things like that. So yeah, it's really kind of fun. These these things are really great. Architects use these all the time uh, and engineers. So um, let's try out a few of our swatches. Let's start out maybe smaller first. And then maybe like in a little while, maybe toward the end of the video, we'll do larger swatches. So we'll maybe use a larger sheet of paper and we'll expand our table here, make it larger and we'll use larger brushes. But we'll start with smaller brushes first. And if you want to keep this really neat and organized, if you like, you can always take a, a ruler and then maybe make some pencil lines and say, let's, let's say we're going to go with maybe this size swatch here. So then let's see how many we can, one, two, three. So maybe three rows we can do with that size. So I'll make a pencil line across here, one, two, So one up here, two and three. We'll give ourselves plenty of room to work. Doesn't have to be perfect. If you really wanted to get super accurate, you could actually, you know, measure everything out or something and, you know, really have fun with it. If you like to do measuring, you know, measuring things and scaling things out or whatever, but this is pretty accurate the way we're going to do it here. And then I'll just take my quarter inch and I'll just move my water container. So I have my water container, which is a glass and uh, with some fresh clean water and then a sponge that I damp. I, I, I soaked it in water and then wrung it out completely so it's just, right now it's just damp. So we'll use that to, um, with our water container to check our water. And let's do some squares here. So we'll just, right away I notice that I'm, have to be careful not to get my stencil into my paints here. That could really kind of be a problem so let's do this let's use this one here and let's just make them and we'll just rest the bottom of our square on the line we, we drew and we can just go right across and we'll do how many do we have there five so we'll do five squares across and we'll just keep going here they don't have to be perfect you can do one fast. So we'll go fast here like this. See how fast we can go on this. Okay, and then on this one we'll take our time. We'll make this one more accurate. Take our time. And there we go. We have all of our swatches set up, drawn in with our Statler <coughs> stencil template. I guess these are called templates. I call them stencils, I guess, for whatever reason, but they're really, they're, I guess, a professional square template. And let's get started painting. So we're just doing some practice. Pa practicing your brush strokes is really going to help you a lot. Um, And this way, when you're painting, you won't be kind of bothered and kind of, you know, you won't have, like in, in the paint, in the watercolor process, you kind of want to be moving kind of qu quickly, expeditiously through your painting, moving at a good pace. So the thing is, um, when you do a lot of these swatches, you kind of build up like a, a muscle memory 
so that when you're using your brush, you're always going to feel comfortable with your brush strokes. You're not going to really get, you know, bogged down and, and slowed up by wondering how you're going to kind of paint a certain section of your painting. When you've used your brush so much and you practice so much your brush strokes and these swatches, you're not going to have that issue. You'll, you'll be able to just kind of like go right through your painting in a nice flow, a nice even flow. And um, you'll also get used to the paints and how when you're mixing paints, how does that feel when you're mixing your colors? So how is it going to feel when you're mixing your colors? What color are you going to do? How much water are you going to use? A lot of water, maybe just a little bit of water to hardly any water. So you'll learn all these things as you practice these swatches. You can make these swatches like you could do nothing but really, really light swatches. Or you could do nothing but really, really thick, heavy paint swatches. You can try all different methods. Or you can do the same thing within one swatch. So let's do that. Let's um, take a look and start out with our cerulean blue. And I'll just dip right in there. And I'm using a small round brush here. So we're going to start out with the round brush on this on this row here. And then next we'll move to a square brush. And a uh, flat brush. And you'll see um, how different it is when you switch from one brush to the next. You kind of have to learn different ways of moving your brush around to get the angles correct and keep yourself on track with painting a good swatch within these squares we've drawn. So let's start out. I'm going to go with one thick heavy paint on this swatch. So now I'm going to start to move. I'm keeping my hand on the paper, resting on the paper the whole time. So I'm not really painting from my arm, but I'm really painting from my hand and wrist, really. And my hand again is stabilized always, resting on the paper. And that's a really beautiful dark tonal value for our cerulean blue. Very thick paint, and that's going to give you the results you want if you have a really beautiful, rich, uh, exciting, lots of chroma for your cerulean blue. You can get that by just going, going straight into your paint and not really adding any water. Now, let's rinse our brush, take a little bit of water off the brush, and now we'll go into a lighter, more water, less paint, and see how that looks. Let's start up here. Maybe we'll do an H stroke. So the first one we did was kind of a Z stroke like that where you just start out with a Z shape and then you fill in. This one here is an H stroke so I'm just going to go two. Two lines like that. And then maybe one in the middle. One up here. And one over here. And this one looks kind of nice. It's kind of like blue jeans or something. That lighter cerulean blue. That really looks good. And you can see it's quite a bit lighter than this. We use, you know, quite a bit more water and less paint than we did on our first swatch. So right away we're kind of learning how using straight out of the tube paint you can get a really rich, exciting, uh, dark tonal value with your cerulean blue. And then here you get a lighter, adding more water, you get that lighter cerulean blue. Which can be like, you know, this could be maybe sky washes or water or blue jeans if you're doing some drawings of... Um, some figures and you have clothing and things like that so you can use this really for any application for any type of uh, painting you're doing and then um so we have that let's even go with a lighter blue yet so let's add more water to that and we'll see what that looks like in this one we'll do maybe an s s stroke and then fill in Okay, and there we have even a lighter version of this cerulean blue. So you can kind of see how I'm getting from the darker tonal value to the middle and then toward the lighter tonal values like that. Then maybe we might try out a cobalt blue. Let's try cobalt blue and let's keep this straight paint here. So we're going to use just straight paint, no water really, just a damp brush and then right into the tube paint. And let's see how we can get this to look. Lots of paint. Remember, lots of paint for this one. Not much water at all.
and I hope you're painting along with me and having a good time here. And we're just going to, again, practice our brushwork. This will really, and it's kind of relaxing, isn't it? When you're doing painting like this, it's very relaxing because there's real no stress. We're not creating actually a painting. I mean, you could make this into a painting if you wanted to, I imagine. Um, when it's all completed and maybe do some other creative ideas to it. But each one of you, you you're your own artist and you're, you have your own ideas and creativity. So, you know, I'm just mentioning that, you know, this you could make this into a painting, I guess, really. It could be, you know, kind of in the style of cubism. And you might add other things to it. Maybe smaller, really, really small cubes or, or squares within this painting. So you do the larger ones first and then you can go in and do really, really small ones and maybe you can get a really, really small round brush. This is not this is pretty small for a round brush, but they make some way smaller brushes. I might even have one handy here and close by. Let's see if I do. Uh, let's see, where is that? I just saw it in a second ago. This one here. So this is a round brush and it's, you know, quite a bit smaller. And this is for really, really fine work if you're doing like some real detail work on a painting and you need something really super small. Like that. You could also use a, a needlepoint brush to get really small squares if you wanted to. To paint in some really, really tiny small squares and then even some larger ones on top of this. You can make a real fun, kind of like interesting cubism style painting. Maybe we'll do that, actually. <clears throat> maybe we'll do that. We'll kind of maybe work on something like this. Maybe we'll practice some of these swatches and then we'll create a, a cubism style painting just for the fun of it. So let's keep working here. We did cobalt blue. Let's take cobalt blue and then we'll um, add some water to it. More water, less paint now. So we use straight paint there pretty much. And you can see that really dark tonal value you get with your cobalt blue. And then we can just go in and do a a lighter value. And that's again like a blue jean kind of color, faded blue. And you can leave some white paper once in a while if you want within your um, your swatches. It doesn't have to be perfect or you know you can do different things to practice what it's like to leave some white paper a little bit here, some little sparkles of white paper. Other times you can try to get a perfect wash with no imperfections and um, let's see let's keep going here so we did blue let's do uh, some green maybe so I'll take my green let's go with sap green and then pretty much straight sap green with just a little bit of water and that's going to be our Uh, sap green swatch, straight paint, and almost no water. And that gives you that rich, beautiful, um, highly dense green with really hardly any uh, transparency to it. Then we can go to our next swatch and let's take that green and just add a lot of water to it. And then we'll we'll create more of a op uh, this would be a more of a transparent green where you're going to let the let the paper show through and have more of a transparent feel to the wash, making it a lighter tonal value. And these are really nice. These are you know. Kind of reminds me of floral pictures with, with leaves and, and uh, flowers and things like that. Grass landscape scenes where you want to have dark and light tonal values within your greens. So we can um, branch out a little bit and have a little more fun here. Let's add some cadmium lemon yellow to that green. And let's see if we can make a more of a lively looking green, fresher looking green. And again, after a while, when you do swatches a lot, I think they're, they're a little bit easier to do. I remember when I first started doing swatches, I was painting out of the lines a lot. Or I had a hard time filling in 
the swatch once I got maybe a couple things in there, like a couple brush strokes. But I started off with the S and the Z stroke and the H strokes. I started with all that when I first started practicing brushwork and I practiced it so many times now that it's kind of just easy to, to paint in these swatches. But in the beginning it was a little, little, little tough. And um, let's see, let's try some raw sienna here. And let's go with uh, straight raw sienna, no water. Beautiful golden color, the color of gold. Okay, and that's pretty much straight tube paint, no water, except for a damp brush, really. And a little bit of that spritzer water that was in there, but not much at all, hardly any water. And then now we'll take that same color, we'll rinse off our brush, just take a little bit of water off, then maybe go back in and get a little more water, and we'll do a lighter. And that's a really beautiful light wash of raw sienna. And then we could even go lighter yet. Let's get some more water. We're kind of noticing our water is still pretty clear. And let's even do a lighter. Barely any pigment, just mostly water. And you, you can see how light that is. So you have like a dark, a medium, and then a really, really light tone there. Okay, so we've done a lot of uh, blue, green, gold. Let's do some red. Maybe we'll go with some alizarin and crimson. And this would be straight paint, no water. And again, these are very much like beautiful flower colors, alizarin and crimson. Okay, that was straight alizarin crimson from the palette. Then we'll take a little bit of um, alizarin crimson here and add some water to it. And we'll do a light wash. Of alizarin crimson. There we have a really beautiful light wash. <clears throat> then let's do one more red. Let's do um, well, let's do uh, um, cadmium red, and maybe we'll do a medium cadmium red. So a little bit of water in there. Let's see. That looks pretty good too. That's almost straight paint, really. Cadmium red's quite opaque. And then maybe we'll do some burnt sienna. Look at that, how good that looks. So we've kind of tried a little bit of our colors in our palette. We mixed it up, some blue, some green, some gold, some reds, kind of covering like the, um, you know, the spectrum of um, colors that we have in our palette. And obviously we have other colors too we're going to practice up on. But let's take a break right now. So once you have this completed, maybe you have a sheet like this where you have a painting underneath it that didn't come out so great. I have lots of those. And then I just leave, I save the paper, and then I use the other side of the paper to practice up on or even to paint paintings on. No one's ever going to see the other side of the watercolor paper once you put it in a frame. So save your watercolor paper, use both sides. If you do a great painting on the one side, and it, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't use, then you would leave that alone. You wouldn't probably paint on the other side of it. You would try to just leave that one if it really turns out good, you're painting. But if you have a painting that didn't come out so great, then I would save it. That's what I do anyway. So, you know, there's some... Oh, 
Okay, so <clears throat> next thing we'd like to do, we tried out the um, round brush. Let's do Okay, let's try a square brush or a flat brush next. So I'm going to go through the kind of the brushes I'm familiar with that I've used a lot throughout my career. And um, I've used a lot of, I think I've tried all different kinds of brushes really for the most part. So, but the ones that are most, that I use most, I'm, that's the ones I'm going to show you here on my, on this video. And I hope you'll, you know, always branch out and try new brushes when you can or when you feel like you want to change, um, have a change in your uh, style or your technique a little bit. You can try out a different brush and see how it feels and you might incorporate it into your paintings a little more. Usually paintings look good if you just kind of stick with one or two brushes and, you know, style brushes, let's say. Like if you're working with round brushes, you probably would stick with round brushes for the most part and then you might use a needlepoint brush to, you know, get a finer, finer details within your paintings. But uh, that tends to look the best. It tends to make everything look unified when you have only one brush. But it could also be an interesting look if you tried 10 different brushes in a painting too. Who knows? I haven't tried it, but you never know. So anyway, let's take a quick break. We'll come right back. We'll put in some more swatches on our paper here and we'll work on using a um, flat brush here. We're gonna use a uh, Robert Simmons White Sable number 12 flat brush and we'll do some Swatches with this brush and we'll see how it works out. Okay, we'll be right back. All right, so we just took a quick break and uh, keep joining along with me, painting along here. Um, I know sometimes this might be a touch boring for some of you, no big deal. Um, yeah, trust me, it's really gonna have uh, big payoffs. It's gonna pay big dividends to work with your brush and, and really get familiar with using your brush, painting within the swatches, it, it makes your, uh, accuracy a lot better when you're painting because you're kind of forced to work in a small area with your brush and of course then once you're really uh, working comfortably in smaller areas then once you start to open up and maybe paint a little more larger style paintings and things like that and doing larger washes you'll already be comfortable enough to just do more of an easy free bit of painting without wor worrying too much with your brush work because you kind of know if you're painting in those small areas and you can be really accurate in that kind of a, you know, bit of area that you're painting in, well then it makes, just makes more sense that when you're working in larger open areas, you're not going to be stressing over your brushwork and, you know, how everything's going to go as you're painting your painting. You don't want to stress when you paint, if that makes sense. So let's keep going here. Let's get our stencils again. Well, maybe we'll just, uh, this, we'll do some freehand swatches here. So let's do two rows maybe. So I'm just going to do some I'll just draw in some swatches freehand here. And then maybe this one here, I'll just go all the way around without stopping. So that would be like a contour drawing style where you just start in one place and go right around and we don't lift up our pencil. We'll do we'll start up here. We can start down here and go around this way, like that. And maybe we can do some sketchy ones here, like this. Okay, so let's get right in. Water is still looking pretty clear, so we're not worried too much right now about changing out the water, but once it gets a little muddy, we'll change that out. And again, we're using the smaller brushes. Now we started out with the small round brush. Now we'll shift over to the flat brush, small flat brush, and let's fill in these. Let's use some different colors. Let's start out with maybe, let's try some French ultramarine blue, and we'll mix it in a little bit here. You'll never see that cerulean blue once you add some French ultramarine blue like this. And then now we have a flat brush so we can kind of change our modus operandi. We can just maybe do all parallel strokes like this, right across the wash. And that goes pretty quick with a flat brush. 
Then let's go in, let's do some straight French ultramarine blue. And I go straight into the paint. No water, just straight paint. Okay, so you can kind of see a lighter medium tonal value and then a darker tonal value here. French ultramarine blue. And let's go with some burnt umber next here. And we'll go right over here. And then we'll add some water. So we're going to make this a little bit more water, like a medium tonal value. Maybe we'll go this way too. Okay, that looks good. That's a toward the darker tonal value, but not quite. If we use straight burnt umber, let's do that. Let's get some straight tube paint, no water, just a damp brush. You'll be able to see the, the difference there. Okay. So that's quite noticeable. That's a really, really a dark, dark. That looks great. Like if you need to get a dark, dark in your painting, you really don't want to go with any water. You want to just use your brush, damp brush, take some water off on your sponge, and then go right into your palette with your ju juicy, moist paint. Pick up that paint and get in there and get your darks in, whatever, wherever your darks might be in your subject matter and what, whatever you're painting. Some paintings don't have a lot of darks in them, but if, you know, usually if you're, most scenes will have a few areas of some really, really darks. And that's, you know, you could mix a French ultramarine blue, which I often do. French ultramarine blue and burnt umber make great, beautiful darks with that warm and cool. Let's do one of those. So let's take some French ultramarine blue, put that there like so. Pick up some burnt umber, add that into it. And you can see how that really creates a beautiful dark. Then we can take this and add French ultramarine blue up here to that burnt umber, and it's, this will be more of a medium tonal value, so it won't be as dark. But that's still going to be quite dark. And then we can lighten up a little bit as we go across here. You can kind of see it's getting a little bit lighter. And then a little bit more water. There we go. So those are subtle changes going from very, very dark to lighter. And we could just keep going down the line here and lighting, lightening things up. But I think you kind of get the idea here. You can go, you know, you can get some super dark darks to some medium darks there. And then maybe we'll change our colors here. Let's go with, um, let's do some Viridian Green straight out of the palette. Beautiful green. And that's straight Viridian Green right from the palette. Then we can take that and then just mix a little bit of water in there. And we'll get the lighter version of that. looking beautiful and, and there is some of the burnt umber and French ultramarine blue left in my brush so it might be subtle and hard to see from on the video but I can see some like brown in there and a little bit of the blue with that Viridian green it kind of makes a really beautiful wash a nice mix if you have a little bit of other subtle colors mixed within the primary color you're going to use for like let's say a specific area of your painting or, or specific wash 
Um, let's maybe go with, uh, let's try some cadmium yellow straight out of the tube. There we go. Okay, and then I'll rinse off the brush, take a little bit of water off there. Let's go over here and we'll just add a little bit of water to it. We'll make it a lighter wash of the cadmium yellow. And there we go. And then you could even you could make another swatch over here in almost no just the most tiny amount of paint and lots of water and you can kind of see you can get that very very light uh, lemony yellow this is kind of a cadmium yellow not quite as uh, um, cool as a cadmium lemon yellow but it is quite light there it's almost like a raw sienna okay so this is really fun all right so now we're going to move on to our mop brush so we'll, we'll take a quick break we'll change our paper and then we'll move on to our mop brush and um, we'll see how that performs for us as far as uh, Working with that, we'll use a small mop brush and um, we'll get started in just a second. So um, I'd like to take breaks often. Let's take a break now and then we'll make some more swatches and um, we'll start with our mop brush next and see how that uh, handles. Okay, all right, we'll be right back. All right. I just want to zoom in a second here. And that looks pretty good. I was trying to do a little bit of a uh, check on my uh, on my focus on my camera. So I'm going to lift up this paper, and I'll we'll start with another fresh piece of paper. Before I do that, I just want to zoom in, make sure I. Have my zoom in good here. Okay, I'm I'm in luck this time. It's not good to find out your my picture's not in focus when I'm painting on videos here. Okay, now we'll start with a new bit of paper. Uh, we'll use some tape here just to tape it down so it doesn't move around on us. I always tape down my paintings and even if I'm just doing compositions or swatches or or whatever, I always use a little bit of tape. And I think we'll change out that water now, so I'll do that quickly. And I use an orange juice container to uh, fill up my water glass of water here and then I have my damp sponge here for checking off a little water now we're going to go with um, a new set of swatches we'll use our um, mop brush this is a smaller mop brush we'll use the larger one uh, a little bit further into the video when we do some larger swatches but these are Alvaro Castanet mop brushes and again we used uh, a Da Vinci we started out with the Da Vinci um, uh, Pure Kalinsky travel brush round brush the tip of the brush is worn off a little bit from using it a lot, but uh, it's still it's still good. And then we use the, I just happen to have this White Sable Robert Simmons um, number 12 flat brush, which is a small size 2. And this one happens to be a 70, uh, 762B, that's the stock number for it. And uh, so what I'm going to do next is... We'll draw some more swatches. We'll use our our, 
stencil. Our template. Let's do our template. And we'll make this one maybe a little larger. Yeah, let's do this. Let's make these a little bit larger, these swatches. Mop brushes carry a lot more water. So they're a little more... Um, you need a little more larger paper when you're using a mop brush because they tend to really hold a lot of water and the whole purpose of a mop brush is it's more for larger style paintings for the most part. Even though this is a small mop brush here, it still holds a lot of water and you'll see that we'll really be able to do a swatch really quickly with this brush because of its uh, the nature of its squirrel hair. So squirrel hair is very absorbent, it holds a lot of water versus the Klinsky sable brushes. They hold a good amount of water, but not quite as much as the squ uh, squirrel here. And we'll just keep working our way around here. And there we go. Okay, now let's start by, let's take some, I always tend to use um, paper towels to clean my palette, so I'll dip that into some water. I'll move this out of the way for a second here, and I'll just use a damp paper towel and just lift up all the paint out of the used paint that we've been using from the palette. I'll maybe do the first, first bit of, um, uh, cleaning with a very damp paper towel and then I'll come back with a second drier piece of paper towel and this way I can just and now we have a fresh surface to work with clean no other mixes in there we'll start fresh and uh, let's get going here so I'm going to start out with some purple, a fair amount of, good amount of water, a good amount of paint, sort of like a medium tonal value. And let's see how this, so this really covers a lot quickly and it's got a great point on it too. So you can get those really fine details as you're painting. And then let's lighten that up a little bit. We'll go with a lighter bit of wash. So I just add more water like this. And we'll see how this does here. There we go. So we got a Nice dark tonal value with our purple. This is a Windsor Newton uh, Ultramarine Violet. That's my favorite violet color for painting and watercolor. And then we just added lots of water and just a little bit of paint and then you get that really beautiful lighter uh, tonal value and wash with less paint, more water. And then I'll just go in and since we used a lot of water there. We'll just kind of give ourselves some more space here to um, work on our next swatch. So we did purple. Um, let's do some some Payne's Gray. Let's try some Payne's Gray with our washes here. Let's maybe, these are gray for like stormy clouds and things like that. That looks fantastic. Okay, that's our Payne's Gray, light wash of Payne's Gray. Not too much pigment. Um, and then we can even, if we were doing some experimentation and said, well, what does it look like with straight Payne's Gray? We could take a little small spot on the top of the swatch, maybe, 
and go into our palette and get a lot of straight paint. And maybe load up the top of the swatch with straight pigment like that. And then you can kind of see the, the variations of it. And then you can even take your brush and dry off paint, uh, water. So we take our brush, rinse it off. We dry off some of that water, most of the water. And now we just have a damp brush. And then we can even lift up a little bit of paint off the, like that. And then maybe we can do that again. We rinse off. Maybe it's even better we use this like a tissue and dry off almost all the water off the brush. If you use tissue, it dries up almost 90% of the water off of the brush. And then we can do that and lift up like that, like so. And then you can kind of see the different variations of tonal value within that one swatch. Or you could even just take the tissue and blot up a section of your, of your swatch like that. And that can give you some different ideas on how that will look for you in a painting if you want to use Payne's Gray. Let's try Ivory Black now. And then maybe we'll start out with straight Ivory Black. And that's straight out of the tube, Ivory Black, Windsor Newton. Then I go in, rinse off the brush, take a little bit of water off the brush, so I just have a damp brush now. And then I can take that wash and slowly work it down. That's Payne's Gray, Ivory Black. Rinse off the brush. Check some water off, maybe even use a little bit of tissue. And then maybe tap up a little bit on the bottom. good that gives you a nice feeling of what the paint's going to look like um, when you use the straight paint versus letting it fade down into almost no paint and mostly all water you get the the real look of it and I have numbers of these pages of swatches that I've done like this uh, in my studio so I use them as reference so if I kind of want to see what something's going to look like if, for a range of tonal values I have swatches just like this in my uh, in a folder in my in my studio, and I can reference them anytime I want. So these are great. You can save these swatches, and you put them in a folder, and you have them, and you always can refer back to them. And if you're using the same paints and colors, for the most part, you know, it's kind of easy once you get them uh, together like this and paint it onto your paper. Uh, you know, you'll have them. And uh, let's continue. Let's uh, let's do some orange. Okay, then we can let that set there for a little bit. Sometimes that's an advantage when you're working. You can like get some paint, some straight paint out there on the paper, and you kind of let it sit, and it kind of absorbs into the paper, and kind of acts as like almost like it it holds the the uh, pa uh, the, the paint actually like uh, adheres to the paper almost, so that it won't flow down as much. Whereas if we tried to fl flow this down right now, it'll move really really quick. But if you let this set for just a couple minutes and then start working it down, you'll have an easier time getting a nice wash like this where it's kind of soft from dark to light, you know, in that soft transition. So if you let that set just a few seconds, like we're doing, that works really good. Now I'm going to go in here, rinse off my brush. Check off some of the water on the brush. You can leave a little white line sometimes of paper there.
That's great for like a sunset. Or a sunrise. Okay, let's uh, let's try the same color. Actually, we might want to go with. Let's try this chromium of oxide. Chromium of oxide. And then I'm going to try to rinse the brush off, take some water off, quite a bit of water off. And then I'm going to try to work this down. Always going a little more paint up there. Okay, that looks good. That could be like a, a grass field. Or some leaves, maybe some leaves in a flower painting, some like a mountain with some green greens in there. Or it could be anything, any kind of structure, a house that might have green paint, you know. Just an idea of darker tonal values, again, softening up and getting into a lighter wash as we go down. And you could work dark up too. So we could try that. Let's go with some olive green. Let's go straight olive green paint right there. Okay, then I'll rinse off the brush. And I'll work it upwards. And these could be bushes or trees. Maybe a little bit of blue for the sky. Okay, so that, that worked out good too. You know, you can do it in reverse and do your darker tonal value at the bottom of your color swatch and then work your, your lighter tonal value wash up into the top area of your... Or you can do it side to side. Let's try it side to side here. Uh, let me see, what else do we have here? Uh, let's do some raw umber. We haven't used that yet. Raw umber. Okay, that's straight raw umber out of the tube. I rinse off my brush, take a little bit of water off on the sponge, and then we just wet this. right across, like so. That could be some rocks. Maybe we add a little bit of blue, maybe some cobalt blue. This could be like a rock kind of color, stone color maybe. Or maybe it could be a some earth colors you're mixing. With warm and cool it always looks good if you can mix your colors. Warm and cool. bit of cobalt blue just to mix in some now we'll start doing some you know kind of doing warm and cool mixtures as we go that's one of my favorites mixing a cobalt or cerulean blue into a, a raw umber or a burnt umber it looks really beautiful okay let's keep uh, moving along here um, let's see, okay, let's try some of our Prussian blue, let's try, uh, right 
to left. We'll use a lighter bit of Prussian blue. I don't have a lot in my palette there. But Prussian blue is beautiful. It's kind of like a cool blue. Lots of green in there. So I kind of use my brush as like a um, kind of like an ink pen where I just kind of dip it into the ink if you can think of it as an ink pen and then I just kind of tap it onto my wet paper so the wet paper is already there and I just tap in that darker wash and looks good. We rinse off the brush, take a little bit of water off that brush and then we just bring it over here with a light damp brush. And that's uh, Prussian blue, and you could do some really nice, uh, maybe yellow ochre with that Prussian blue. And that kind of excites it a little bit. Warm and cool again. Nice mix of warm uh, yellow ochre mixed with some Prussian blue. Okay, now let's do some rose matter. Rose matter is very transparent. Rinse off the brush. Okay, and then we could mix in a little bit of sap green. Great combination. Warm and cool. Let's do two more. Let's do um, cadmium red. And then maybe we can mix with that some French ultramarine blue. Rinse the brush, rinse the brush, and then I just blend these together a little bit. Okay, and then let's do one more cerulean blue. Straight paint. Bird Sienna, Cerulean Blue. Warm and cool. Rinse off the brush and blend that a little more. All right, so we had some fun, right? We kind of were kicking it up a notch by blending some colors, getting some different. Um, uh, techniques going here. We're practicing our blending now, going from light to dark within one uh, color swatch, and then also blending and lightening and dark darkening in one color swatch with variations of colors, like two colors. You know, you can mix any colors you want, really. 
I'm doing some of my favorites that I know I like to do, which is basically warm and cool colors together. So, you know, I'm always kind of thinking warm and cool always looks good. It kind of just gives a nice counter, uh, like a, you know, it's just like a, a counter exchange effect, like where you're having each warm and cool playing against each other in one swatch within two different colors. And of course, either in the cool family of the palette and then the warmer side of the palette. So if we mix those up in our paintings within areas, it really looks great. It kind of makes a little bit of a excitement within the uh, washes. So that's what we were doing here. Again, you know, adding some um, warm and cool colors together in our color swatches. And uh, I think we really have done a lot now. Now we're gonna bump up and do larger uh, swatches. We've done our three um, brushes that we wanted to work with. The round, the flat brush, and then the mop brush. So we're gonna do these same three brushes except the larger version of these brushes which I have right next to me here. So now we have larger brushes. The same exact brushes just in the larger style size and then we're going to use a larger sheet of paper and you'll notice maybe I'll use a different palette. We'll use a larger palette so we have more room to mix up our washes. Because when you go with a larger sheet of paper when you're working you'd obviously want to increase the size of your palette and increase the size of your brushes and that's really you have it. You just do those two adjustments and then you can paint larger paintings. And of course it's a little more challenging when you do larger paintings because if you're used to painting a lot maybe in smaller sizes of paintings it's a little you're using like more paint, more water, larger again brush strokes and larger areas you have to work in which can be a little bit of a challenge and I know when I started working with larger sheets of paper it was a little bit of a challenge at first. Uh, it caught me off guard. I didn't realize it would be you know, difficult. It's, it's just a matter of getting used to it as well. I'm saying it's not anything like rocket science or, you know, too difficult, but it, it is something that's a change for maybe some of you who haven't worked in larger style paintings. You know, you'll find that it does take a little bit of getting used to. In any case, let's get started with our larger brushes and larger swatches in just a second. I'm going to reset my um, paper up here and my palette and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back again. We, cha we changed the table here, just so you kind of know where <clears throat> I just put a new piece of a uh, sheet of paper down. This is uh, Fabriano paper, actually. I had some large uh, full sheets of Fabriano and I just trimmed it down so it fits within the camera frame here. But you can see this is quite a bit larger than our normal setup. Usually we're working in a space like, like this probably uh, on, you know, 90% of my videos. But here when we're doing swatches, I just wanted to kind of uh, open up the view a little bit here on the camera and kind of just show like, uh, doing some larger swatches are also going to be a benefit if you decide you want to do some larger paintings. Many of you probably are already are doing large paintings and working in a large format, but I always figure there are some of you out there that you're, you haven't worked with a larger format uh, yet with your watercolor paintings, and it's always fun to start and kind of work on those uh, type of larger style paintings, and the perfect way to do it is to start with some larger swatches first, and you don't have to use really fancy paper to do large swatches. You can actually use printer paper, uh, to practice large swatches if you did an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, let's say. So this is approximately an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Um, a folder like this, a manila folder. So you could work with this style of size and practice your brush strokes and your swatches on a piece of like, you know, printer paper, which is, you know, very, you know, a lot less expensive than, than good watercolor paper. But if you're doing a finished painting, you would use obviously something like this if you're going to go for a, a finished painting. So, and I'm doing a YouTube video, so I always like to bring my best paper out, my best paints, all my best, best gear. And, um, for you. And, uh, so we're going to start out. Let's use our Fiskars template. And we will, let's do these large, let's do a couple large swatches here. One there. And then let's do one here. And then we can elongate this one. Slide this on down like so. And we'll make this kind of like a rec rectangle like that, portrait style, square. And uh, we'll do another couple like that there. And 
I like to leave a little bit of room in between. And I'll do the same thing. Three sides first, and then slide this down like so. And then like that. So let's start off with these. Now what I'm going to do is I have my uh, larger style palette, which I like to use. Uh, when I use when I create larger paintings, I'll use this style palette. I have other palettes like this that are a little more, um, you know, pretty much they're similar to this. Let's say so. This is a, a you can see this is a, a pretty large palette. This one's readily available. This is a uh, Holbein palette, aluminum palette, and actually Anderson makes it too. So I think there's an Anderson. This is an Anderson palette. It's called Anderson, the, the uh, brand aluminum palette. So this is my uh, aluminum. It's black. It's got the hinge here. Thumb hole. So this is what I like to use when I'm painting a larger style painting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold my palette next to me as I'm painting, show you what colors I'm using, and then I'll go onto the paper. So the first brush we'll use, we'll, we'll start again with our round brush, but now we're, again, we've moved our brush up to a large. This is a number 16, Da Vinci uh, number 16 Maestro brush. And my water, pa uh, my water bucket's over here on the right-hand side, so I just usually come over here like this, into the water bucket. And I also forget, I, if I met, didn't mention, uh, please subscribe on the right-hand side below here on the... Um, screen you'll see uh, subscribe and uh, when you subscribe it says basically you'll get my newer videos that are coming out uh, in the future so I'm always making new videos each week each month and year after year we're constantly making new videos here and I want you to have all my videos just so you're kind of in the know and you can kind of see what I'm working on and I want you to benefit from all my videos and um, so I hope you'll subscribe and you can click also on the um, notifications bell which means you'll be notified too that I've created a new video so you'll know when it'll be more convenient for you to work with me uh, and work along with all of us here. So again, let's start out here. I'm going to take my palette and I might even hold it like this so I can, a little bit easier. So we're going to start with our first swatch. And again, now we're using a larger brush, larger paper. Let's see how that works out with our round brush, larger round brush. Let's start out with some French ultramarine blue. We have a really large working area for our paints. Maybe we'll add in a little bit of green to that, blue-green, maybe. Maybe a touch of... Um, that is Payne's Gray. Let's see if we can... And then, you know, you can use an S stroke like that, where you just start out up here and go like this, swing your brush down, pick up some more paint, and then maybe you can tidy up the, the rest of the, the swatch like so. So now what we're doing is, obviously, We were just working on these size swatches, and now we're just bumping it up and making them really large. And what this will do with this will actually help you to just really get your brush strokes more accurate when you're working in larger format. So these are great to practice. Again, you're really going to benefit tremendously by practicing these larger swatches. And these happen to be, if we uh, take our ruler, these are approximately three and a half inch by three and a half inch squares. And this one here is five by three and a half. So that's about the size of these swatches. And these swatches are probably like inch and a half by inch and a half. Uh, yeah, one yeah, inch and a quarter by inch and a quarter. Okay, let's go with another swatch here. Let's go with, uh, let's go with a cadmium red. I'm going to use some really thick paint here. I'll put it out into the palette first, kind of mix it out a little bit. I'll add a little bit of water to it, just to thin it out a little bit, and then let's try that. Let's try doing uh, a Z-stroke. We'll do this, cross. 
down like that, spin around like so, and come across this way. Then we'll get a little more paint, touch of water, just to thin that out a little bit. And then we can just fill this in. Then you can always take your brush and roll your brush around a little bit to get a point on your brush, like so. And then you carefully, I rest my hand on the paper, and I can get them tidy up the rest of my corners on my swatch here, like so. So I hope you're having a really fun time painting these swatches. And this is again lots of paint, not that much water, but what we'll do is we'll now make a lighter version over here. We'll do a graded wash over here of each of these colors. So I'm going to rinse my brush now. I'm actually going to change out my water. When you work with really large formats, you really have to work with uh, fresh clean water to get some really beautiful looking washes. So you can either do one of two things. You can use two water buckets. You can do three things. You can, one, just use one water bucket. So let's just kind of cover this. When you're using large paintings and large format, you're going to find that your, your water is going to get real muddy really fast. So what I do is I change my water really frequently all the time. So I'm constantly changing out my water bucket, emptying it, filling it with new water constantly. Or if you don't want to keep emptying your bucket for whatever reason, if it's not convenient for you in your studio or where you're working, if you're working in your kitchen or your living room or your uh, dining room, your bedroom, wherever, your basement, wherever you like to do your watercolor painting, outdoors, whatever it is, you know, if it's more convenient, you can use two water buckets. So what you would do is you would take your first water uh, color bucket and then you would, when you're done doing a swatch, you would go into the water over here first, which might be more your first rinse, and then you go in for your second rinse, which would be your clear water, which stays a lot clearer and cleaner because you're doing your first rinse, rinse of your brush in a first container. So you'll have two containers going at the same time. You'll change this one more often, your dirtier, muddier water, and then you go into your cleaner pail for your next. That's another method you can use for keeping your water clean as you work, because if you're doing light washes, really light washes in your paintings, you got to have clean water when you do that. Otherwise, it'll muddy up your colors and make things look really unpleasant. So the two water container idea works really good. And I've also seen another great artist. One time I saw he used a really large bucket. And the uh, reasoning behind that is if you have a very large water pail, maybe something like a um, like a couple gallon bucket. Um, I think I have something. Okay, I have things in this bucket, but you see how big this bucket is? Like this is a really, if you have a large bucket like this in, by your work table and you have it like filled, filled up three quarters of the way up to the top with all clean, fresh clean water, what happens is when you rinse your brush off in the bucket, all the sediment and colors sinks down to the bottom of your bucket and you always have fresh clean water in your bucket all the time. So that would be if you just don't even want to bother wasting time and you just want to paint and have a great time painting, this is probably the ultimate way you want to go if you're painting in a large format like this. You have a large bucket with filled with water, you know, three quarters of the way full with water up to here. And this is like a two gallon bucket. Uh, you get at the you know, big box stores, like in the painter's section, where the, where the uh, commercial uh, professional painters, they use these buckets all the time for when they paint in houses and commercial projects and things like that. But in any case, this large bucket, if you have it next to your table, and you have it, you know, pretty much almost to the top full, you can just continually rinse your brush and you'll always have fresh clean water at the very top of your bucket because all that sediment's going to go down to the bottom of the bucket. And so then you only have to change out and clean your bucket maybe once a month or something like that. And you just rinse out all the bottom of the sediment, you know, from the oil, uh, from the paints and you're all good to go. So that's just like a little bit of a bit of information that really helps if you're really going to do large paintings. So again, let's get back into this and Payne's gray. Now what I'm going to do is we'll do a graded wash. So we'll start out with a little bit of a darker wash here, more paint, decent amount of water and quite a bit of paint. And let's go right across the top here. And this is Prussian blue.
like that. Now we're going to do a graded wash. Let's take our brush, rinse off the brush, mix out a little bit of a lighter wash there to the left over here, a little bit of a lighter wash here, and go across like this. Now to make it even more exciting, let's go with a warm color. Let's go with some raw sienna and red. So raw sienna and red. Let's mix that in like here with the blue. And then we rinse our brush one more time. And now we don't even have to really do much. We can just take our brush and we can um, maybe I'll put this down here. I'll rinse off my brush, tap it on the sponge a little bit here and then just with a damp brush I'm gonna smooth this out down here. And if you need to lighten it up a little bit on the bottom, you can grab a clean tissue and just blot up a little bit of paint along the bottom to lighten it up a little bit. And there you have it, a nice graded wash. Starting out with some Prussian blue and mixing it on down with some raw sienna to make it a little bit of a warm and cool uh, mix of colors. Best thing to do though, once you get your wash on the paper, you probably don't want to go back in too much and fuss with it. So that's one thing if you want to keep your colors and your washes nice and smooth looking without any discolor you know, discoloration or like water spots, cauliflowers, blossoms, blooms, everyone has different names for it. But usually if you go back in and keep touching up your washes, you'll have problems where you'll see funny looking spots of uh, a wash that look kind of uh, unpleasant looking. So if you can kind of get your wash done in one good go and then you leave it like that, you're, you're much better off. So the thing is, I guess, not to fuss, fuss too much with uh, the, um, the uh, wash once you have it on there. So let's do another graded wash here. So what I'll do is I have plenty of working room on my palette, as you can see. This palette's really large. I have lots of space to mix colors, so let's do that. I'm going to mix some more colors here. Let's do this same color again. It's kind of like a cadmium red, brick red. And uh, let's start out with that up top. And then we'll um, mix it with some, uh, uh, possibly we'll do some orange, some cadmium yellow. And then maybe we'll do some Prussian blue at the bottom. So I'm going to use three colors. Cadmium red over here cadmium orange, and then some Prussian blue, and we'll do like almost a sunset look. So the sun, sunset of the red and orange sky, and then the water, the blue, beautiful, cool water. We'll try to do a graded wash like that. So I have my water pail, I rinse off my brush, and then I go in and I get my red, maybe even a little bit of lizard and crimson up top here. Okay, and then some cadmium red there. Okay, let's do that. And what I'll do is I'll go about the first third of the top of my paint swatch here, like so. Okay, I'll rinse my brush off, go back in, I'll get some of that orange. I hope you saw that, I got some orange paint mixed in that. And I go up into the red a little bit to kind of mix it on down, like so. And I'm just using that swirling effect a little bit as I go down this way. Then I'll take a little bit of Prussian blue and start to mix it in a little bit at a time though. I don't want to go too much with... Let's mix that back up into that wash there. And then at the bottom let's pick up that beautiful Prussian blue like this and we'll mix that right up into there like so. And 
And then even if you want, you can go in and get some straight Prussian blue like this. Put that down in here like so. I rinse off my brush. I use my sponge, take off a little bit of water so it's a damp brush. And I just blend that in. Like that. Okay, so we have a beautiful graded wash in a sunset style color configuration with our red up top, which is alizarin crimson, cadmium red. So I use my alizarin crimson and cadmium red here, up here first. Then I added some orange to the center part of this swatch, which is here, the orange, mixing that in. And as we get toward the bottom, we used our Prussian blue to fill in the rest of the wash down below. And that kind of gives you a kind of a sunset feel along the water. I think that looks really good. And let's create a few more swatches here. Let's use a new brush. Let's use our mop brush now. Or let's do it with square, our flat brush. Let's use our flat brush next. Okay, so we're gonna use this larger flat brush as you can see. So the first one we used was quite a bit smaller as you can see. Probably about a third of the size, no, about half the size. So now we're going to use this larger size and we'll create our swatches again. Now we'll do our next one. Let's do our next uh, swatch here. Freehand, let's do it freehand. We don't have to do the template every time or the, the um, our uh, stencil or our template. We don't have to use that all the time. We can use this. Just a freehand couple of a, a square and a rectangle. Okay, and again, we have tons of room on our palette so we don't have to worry about not having enough space. So we have our sponge there to check off some water. Now I wouldn't do this. I'm doing this because I'm on camera. Oh, let's move down here. I don't want to make a mess over here. We just did these nice swatches. Let's not ruin them. Okay, so now we have our flat brush. Now we're going to do some different colors and we have tons of room again here on this palette. So we don't have to start cleaning up our palette yet. We can just keep working. We have tons of room. Let's go with um, some green. So let's go with uh, some sap green. Some sap green here. So I'm just going to get some nice sap green on there. Uh, maybe over here we'll do some more. Let's do some sap green over here. And then some olive green. So sap green, olive green. Let's use some of that blue. And then we'll do a little bit of uh, raw sienna and raw umber, and a little bit of uh, cadmium lemon yellow. So we'll kind of mix out a little bit of a, we'll mix out a little bit of some colors here. You can kind of see how I did that. So that's kind of like a floral painting or some landscape paintings where you have a, a different, you know, like some uh, variations of color, some burnt sienna up here maybe. So greens, so we have uh, burnt sienna, sap green, olive green, raw umber and cadmium lemon yellow. So then we have a whole variation of beautiful colors. And we'll start down at the bottom here and we'll do this swatch and we'll make the bottom dark and we'll work on lighter going up top. So let's get some of that first green mix. Burnt sienna, sap green right here. Burnt sienna, sap green. And we're using our flat brush, nice and easy to get those washes on with a flat brush. And then let's go into our raw umber here and some cadmium lemon yellow. And then I just take a little bit of water, get some water mixed into that. And 
and we're getting it a little bit more uh, yellow, more warmer with yellow as we go up. And then we'll rinse off our brush one more time and then I'll really go straight into the cadmium lemon yellow and just mix it like that. And you can see how good that looks. We're all in the same color family, basically green and yellow. And you just, we take this with our flat brush and mix and mingle everything. You can do some X strokes if you want to blend the colors together. But that looks fantastic. That's a beautiful green wash that you can use in landscapes, floral paintings, and any other painting you like. If you like green, I think green's an awesome color. I use green all the time. It's really beautiful with yellow and gold, warm and cool. So that's going to be fine. Well, let's work on another swatch up here. Let's do, um, let's do kind of like an earth color mix. Again, we have tons of space on our palette. Let's do some burnt umber and um, burnt sienna. So let's go with some burnt umber. Burnt sienna. So burnt umber. Burnt sienna. A little bit of um, yellow ochre. I rinse my brush. Go in and get some yellow ochre. Like so. So burnt sienna, burnt umber, yellow ochre. And then maybe we'll transition over to some cerulean blue. So I rinse my brush, brush again. Tap off some of the water on the uh, sponge. And I'll go in and get some cerulean blue here. So these are the kind of colors we're going to kind of mix together. And uh, we'll see how that looks. Let's rinse our brush again. We'll start out with our burnt umber, burnt sienna. Let's go at the bottom here with that mix. Wash is going really nice with a flat brush. Then let's move into the yellow ochre and cerulean blue. And let's finish up strong with some beautiful cerulean blue. Then I can rinse off my brush, tap off some water on the sponge, and then I can blend that in a little bit. I have time to blend this in a little bit, but not a lot of time. So this is kind of where speed comes in with uh, watercolor. You have to move quickly. All right, so we got all of our swatches done so far. We'll work on a few more, but let's take a quick break. We need to take breaks and uh, we'll be right back. All right, we're almost to the finish line here. If you're watching, still you are a watercolor champion. We're doing swatches and we're using a larger palette, larger brushes now. So we started off again, we were just kind of doing a little bit of a recap here. So we started off with smaller swatches first and we were going uphill and then we said, let's shift over to larger swatches. And in the, um, in the logic of if we're gonna create larger paintings eventually, or if we are already creating larger paintings and we want to get a little bit better at our brushwork with larger style format of paintings, we're going to have to do larger swatches. So we just upsized everything. We upsized our palette. We upsized our brushes and we use, we're using larger brushes now. And uh, basically that's really given us the, uh, you know, edge and advantage when we're doing larger uh, paintings. So we're just painting swatches. Yes, we're not creating a finished painting right now. But still, this is crucial practice we have to do as watercolor artists. And you'll, you'll find that you're really going to, it's going to help you a lot if you're working on these larger swatches and things like that. And even your regular size swatches, if you're painting in a more of an average size or, you know, smaller size format when you're doing your watercolors. So let's get going here. Let's not waste time. I'm going to actually clean up 
this pallet. So I will put some fresh clean water in my container and I'm just gonna, let's pretend we're starting a new painting. So we're gonna go right in right away and we're just gonna get our palette and just, we'll use a paper towel, a damp paper towel and we'll just wipe up our washes so we can start with our fresh clean palette. So I'll just go right around the palette like this. That's my first pass there and then we'll wet the dampen up again and we'll just get the rest of our palette nice and tidy here so we have good fresh colors and I'll just get that all situated like so there we go perfect all right so now we're ready to go for another swatch let's do a freehand swatch here so I'm not gonna use my template I'll just use so I'm just gonna do a There we go. Now we're gonna just, we're gonna go for it. We're gonna have a large mop brush. So we talked about the different brushes we use. We upsized all of our brushes. We used um, a larger style round brush here. Then we used our flat brush here. Now we're gonna use our large mop brush. And we're gonna do a really, and this mop brush, is really going to handle this really well. You'll see how much ground we can cover with this. So let's start out. Let's do maybe some, well, let's see what do we, let's use some cerulean blue here. So I'm going to get some cerulean blue out like that. Maybe with a little bit of cobalt blue, a little bit of uh, French ultramarine blue too, maybe up here, a good mixture of a couple of blues. And then let's we'll kind of get our palette all set up so we're ready to paint. And then some raw sienna. I rinse off my brush again. And then I check off a little bit of water. So you can even check off a little bit of the water. So I rinse the brush off, check off some water. Then I go over to my yellow ochre. Let's do some yellow ochre here. Okay, so we have some blue yellow ochre. What else can we do? Maybe a little bit of purple. Ultramarine violet. Let's do a little purple. Okay, so we have we have some pretty good mixes here. So I'm just thinking I'm going to have a little bit of ultramarine violet, purple, but I'm going to have more of the blue and more of the gold, so like this. Okay, and then I'm going to mix plenty of paint so that I don't have to stop and mix again. That's kind of the key to painting sometimes is you, you want to mix up enough of paint of what you need, some washes in your palette. Okay, so we got a little bit of French ultramarine blue too. Okay, there we go. We have our blues, our golds, and a little bit of the purple. Let's get right into it here. Let's start out with some blue up here. Like that. Okay. You can charge in some darker wash up here. So we're just having some fun. So I'm putting that blue wash on and charging in some darker darks up here. Uh, with some French ultramarine blue, maybe even a little touch of the purple there. Why not? Okay, we're going to keep this wash going. Now we're going to get some of that golden, beautiful golden raw sienna and yellow ochre. I'm going to leave a little bit of space in between the washes. Then I can go in and get some straight yellow ochre like that. We're just mixing some colors and having fun. There we go. Okay, and then I'm just going to 
add some water, damp brush and water, and just kind of bring that wash down, like so. And then I'm going to add in some purple. Just a little bit of purple here and there. Wow, look how quick that was. So when you're working with large format, you can see right away that having a large palette with lots of room and space to create large washes of color, and you have a large mop brush, you can really get a lot of wash on the paper quickly, just like that. And that looks just beautiful for an underwash. So if we were using a glazing technique and using a glazing style method for this painting, we might go over this again with a uh, more details, like darker washes over the top of this, but this would be your underpainting, your first um, wash that you could have, and then you can go over with darker washes on top. But this is all the uh, fun things we do as watercolor artists. We do swatches and practice with our brushes. We practice different styles, different color mixes. We practice small and large format, so that this way you have a really good feel for using larger brushes, a larger palette, and um, you know, working with in this larger style here. So glad you're here, glad you're painting along with me. Uh, keep sticking with me here on YouTube. We're doing lots of fun uh, practice like this on this channel, as well as we do our normal format of creating beautiful paintings like seascapes and landscapes and flower paintings, city scenes. We do it all here, all watercolor. So if you're a watercolor artist, you're really gonna enjoy this channel. And I hope I'll see you again very, very soon. And uh, happy painting, everybody. Bye-bye.